You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Before we get into the actual story of the Cask of Montalado, let's take a real quick look at it and a bit of its history. Warning, there are a lot of spoilers here, so if you've never heard the story, you might want to skip forward to the actual story itself. The narrator, Montresor, opens the story by stating that he has been irreparably insulted by his acquaintance, Fortunato, and that he seeks revenge. He wants to exact his revenge, however, in a measured way, without placing himself at risk. He decides to use Fortunato's fondness for wine against him. During the carnival season, Montresor, wearing a mask of black silk, approaches Fortunato. He tells Fortunato that he has acquired something that could pass for a Montalato, a light Spanish sherry. Fortunato, which is Italian for fortunate, wears the multicolored costume of the jester, including a cone cap with bells. Montresor tells Fortunato that if he's too busy, he'll ask a man named Lucchesi to taste it. Fortunato apparently considers Lucchesi a competitor and claims that this man could not tell Amontillado from other types of sherry. Fortunato is anxious to taste the wine and to determine for Montresor whether or not it is truly Amontillado. Fortunato insists that they go to Montresor's vaults. Montresor has strategically planned for this meeting by sending his servants away to the carnival. The two men descend into the damp vaults which are covered with nitra, or saltpeter, a whitish mineral. Apparently aggravated by the nitra, Fortunato begins to cough. The narrator keeps offering to bring Fortunato back home, but Fortunato refuses. Instead, he accepts wine as the antidote to his cough. The men continue to explore the deep vaults which are full of the dead bodies of the Montresor family. In response to the crypts, Fortunato claims to have forgotten Montresor's family coat of arms and motto. Montresor responds that his family shield portrays a huge human foot d'or in a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. The motto in Latin is Nemo me impun lacessit, that is, no one attacks me with impunity. Later in their journey, Fortunato makes a hand movement that is a secret sign of the Masons, an exclusive fraternal organization. Montresor does not recognize this hand signal, though he claims that he is a Mason. When Fortunato asks for proof, Montresor shows him his trowel, the implication being that Montresor is an actual stonemason. Fortunato says that he must be jesting and the two men continue onward. The men walk into a crypt, where human bones decorate three of the four walls. 
the bones from the fourth wall have been thrown down on the ground. On the exposed wall is a small recess where Montresor tells Fortunato that the Amontillado is being stored. Fortunato, now heavily intoxicated, goes to the back of the recess. Montresor then suddenly chains the slow-footed Fortunato to a stone. Taunting Fortunato with an offer to leave, Montresor begins to wall up the entrance to this small crypt, thereby trapping Fortunato inside. Fortunato screams confusedly as Montresor builds the first layer of the wall. The alcohol soon wears off, and Fortunato moans, terrified and helpless. As the layers continue to rise, though, Fortunato falls silent. Just as Montresor is about to finish, Fortunato laughs as if Montresor is playing a joke on him. But Montresor is not joking. At last, after a final plea, for the love of God, Montresor, Fortunato stops answering Montresor, who then twice calls out his enemy's name. After no response, Montresor claims that his heart feels sick because of the dampness of the catacombs. He fits the last stone into place and plasters the wall closed, his actions accompanied only by the jingling of Fortunato's bells. He finally repositions the bones on the fourth wall. For fifty years, he writes, no one has disturbed them. He concludes with a Latin phrase meaning, may he rest in peace. The terror of the cask of Amontillado, as in many of Poe's tales, resides in the lack of evidence that accompanies Montresor's claims to Fortunato's thousand injuries and insult. The story features revenge and secret murder as a way to avoid using legal channels for retribution. Law is nowhere on Montresor's or Edgar Allan Poe's radar screen, and the enduring horror of the story is the fact of punishment without proof. Montresor used his subjective experience of Fortunato's insult to name himself judge, jury, and executioner in this tale, which also makes him an unreliable narrator. Montresor confesses this story fifty years after its occurrence. Such a significant passage of time between the events and the narration of the events makes the narrative all the more unreliable. Montresor's unreliability overrides the rational consideration of evidence, such as particular occurrences of insult that would necessarily precede any guilt sentence in a non-Poe world. The cask of Amontillado takes subjective interpretation, the fact that different people interpret the same things differently, to its horrific endpoint. Poe's use of color imagery is central to his questioning of Montresor's motives. His face, covered in a black silk mask, Montresor represents not blind justice but rather its gothic opposite, biased revenge. In contrast, Fortunato dons the motley-colored costume of the court fool, who gets literally and tragically fooled by Montresor's masked motives. The color schemes here represent the irony of Fortunato's death sentence. Fortunato, Italian for the fortunate one, faces the realization that even the carnival season can be murderously serious. Montresor chooses the setting of the carnival for its abandonment of social order. While the carnival usually indicates joyful social interaction, Montresor distorts its merry abandon, turning the carnival on its head. The repeated allusions to the bones of Montresor's family that line the vaults foreshadows the story's descent into the underworld. The two men's underground travels are a metaphor for their trip to hell. Because the carnival in the land of the living does not occur as Montresor wants it to, he takes the carnival below ground, to the realm of the dead and the satanic. To build suspense in the story, Poe often employs foreshadowing. For example, when Fortunato says, I shall not die of a cough, Montresor replies, true, because he knows that Fortunato will in fact die from dehydration and starvation in the crypt. Montresor's description of his family's coat of arms also foreshadows future events. The shield features a human foot, crushing a tenacious serpent. In this image, the foot represents Montresor and the serpent represents Fortunato. Although Fortunato has hurt Montresor with biting insults, Montresor will ultimately crush him. The conversation about Masons also foreshadows Fortunato's demise. Fortunato challenges Montresor's claim that he's a member of the Masonic Order. 
and Montresor replies insidiously with a visual pun. When he declares that he is a mason by showing his trowel, he means he is a literal stonemason. That is, that he constructs things out of stones and mortar, namely Fortunato's grave. The final moments of conversation between Montresor and Fortunato heighten the horror and suggest that Fortunato ultimately, and ironically, achieves some type of upper hand over Montresor. Fortunato's plea, for the love of God, Montresor, has provoked much critical controversy. Some critics suggest that Montresor has at last brought Fortunato to the pit of desperation and despair, indicated by his invocation of a god that has long left him behind. Other critics, however, argue that Fortunato ultimately mocks the love of God, thereby employing the same irony that Montresor has effectively used to lure him to the crypts. These are Fortunato's final words, and the strange desperation that Montresor demonstrates in response suggests that he needs Fortunato more than he wants to admit. Only when he twice screams Fortunato loudly, with no response, does Montresor claim to have a sick heart. The reasons for Fortunato's silence are unclear, but perhaps his willing refusal to answer Montresor is a type of strange victory in otherwise dire circumstances. Coming up, it's The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. There are very few among those with a love for the supernatural who don't also have a passion for Edgar Allan Poe. Poe wasn't simply a melancholy author who wrote about premature burials, sinister black cats, and talking ravens. He was much more. If you've ever read a modern mystery or horror novel, you can thank Poe. Poe invented the modern mystery story, mostly invented science fiction, and was the first writer to take the horror stories of the Gothic era and set them in modern times, starting a trend that continues today. With a lifelong interest in Poe, Troy Taylor decided to take his own look at the mysterious and macabre writer, his tragic life, unexplained death, and lingering hauntings. He invites listeners along to delve into the strange and bizarre world of Edgar Allan Poe, from his early life to his tragic marriage, his insane grief, his dramatically failed career, his links to an unsolved murder, and the mystery of what happened to the writer in the five days before his unexplained death. Even more than a century and a half later, no one knows what happened to Poe before he was found delirious on the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, or what killed him. Why did he disappear and then show up in an incoherent state, wearing another man's clothes? Where did he go when he vanished and who was the mysterious Reynolds that Poe whispered about in his dying breath? And perhaps strangest of all, does he haunt the mysterious graveyard where his body is buried? Nevermore, The Haunted Life and Mysterious Death of Edgar Allan Poe, written by Troy Taylor, narrated by Darren Marlar. Find a link to the book on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Fortunato had hurt me a thousand times, and I had suffered quietly. But then I learned that he had laughed at my proud name, Montresor, the name of an old and honored family. I promised myself I would make him pay for this, that I would have revenge. You must not suppose, however, that I spoke of this to anyone. I would make him pay, yes, but I would act only with the greatest care. I must not suffer as a result of taking my revenge. A wrong is not made right in that manner. And also the wrong would not be made right unless Fortunato knew that he was paying and knew who was forcing him to pay. I gave Fortunato no cause to doubt me. I continued to smile in his face, and he did not understand that I was now smiling at the thought of what I had planned for him at the thought of my revenge. Fortunato was a strong man, a man to be feared, but he had one great weakness. He liked to drink good wine, and indeed he drank much of it. 
so he knew a lot about fine wines and probably believed that he was a trained judge of them. I, too, knew old wines well, and I bought the best I could find. And wine, I thought, wine would give me my revenge. It was almost dark one evening in the spring when I met Fortunato in the street, alone. He spoke to me more warmly than was usual, for already he had drunk more wine than was good for him. I acted pleased to see him, and I shook his hand as if he had been my closest friend. Fortunato, how are you? Montresor, good evening, my friend. My dear Fortunato, I am indeed glad that I have met you. I was just thinking of you, for I've been tasting my new wine. I've bought a full cask of a fine wine which they tell me is Amontillado. But… Amontillado? Quite impossible! I know, it does not seem possible. As I could not find you, I was just going to talk to Lutresi. If anyone understands wines, it's Lutresi. He will tell me, Lutresi? He does not know one wine from another. But they say he knows as much about wines as you know. Oh, come, let us go. Go where? To your vault to taste the wine. No, my friend, no. I can see that you're not well, and the vaults are cold and wet. I do not care. Let us go. I'm well enough. The cold is nothing. Montalato, someone is playing games with you. And Lutresi, ha! Huh, Lutresi knows nothing about wines, nothing at all. As he spoke, Fortunato took my arm, and I allowed him to hurry me to my great stone palace, where my family, the Montresors, had lived for centuries. There was no one at home. I had told the servants that they must not leave the palace as I would not return until the following morning and they must care for the place. This I knew was enough to make it certain that they would all leave as soon as my back was turned. I took down from their places on the wall two brightly burning lights. I gave one of these to Fortunato and led him to a wide doorway. There we could see the stone steps going down into the darkness. Asking him to be careful as he followed, I went down before him, down under the ground deep under the old walls of my palace. We came finally to the bottom of the steps and stood there a moment together. The earth which formed the floor was cold and hard, we were entering the last resting place of the dead of the Montresor family. Here, too, we kept our finest wines. Here, in the cool, dark, still air under the ground. Fortunato's step was not sure because of the wine he'd been drinking. He looked uncertainly around him, trying to see through the thick darkness which pushed in around us. Here, our brightly burning lights seemed weak indeed but our eyes soon became used to the darkness. We could see the bones of the dead lying in large piles along the walls. The stones of the walls were wet and cold. From the long rows of bottles which were lying on the floor among the bones, I chose one which contained a very good wine. Since I do not have anything to open the bottle with, I struck the stone wall with it and broke off the small end. I offered the bottle to Fortunato. Here, Fortunato, drink some of this fine Medoc. It'll help to keep us warm. Drink! Thank you, my friend. I drink to the dead who lie sleeping around us. And I, Fortunato, I drink to your long life. Ah, a very fine wine indeed. But the Amontillado? It is farther on. Come. We walked on for some time. We were now under the river's bed, and water fell in drops upon us from above. Deeper into the ground we went, past still more bones. Your vaults are many and large. There seems to be no end to them. We are a great family, and an old one. It's not far now. But I can see you're trembling with the cold. Come, let us go back before it's too late. It is nothing. Let us go on. But first, another drink of your Medoc. I took up from among the bones another bottle. It was another wine of a fine quality, a de Grave. Again, I broke off the neck of the bottle. 
Fortunato took it and drank it all without stopping for a breath. He laughed and threw the empty bottle over his shoulder. We went on, deeper and deeper into the earth. Finally, we arrived at a vault in which the air was so old and heavy that our lights almost died. Against three of the walls, there were piles of bones higher than our heads. From the fourth wall, someone had pulled down all the bones, and they were spread all around us on the ground. In the middle of the wall was an opening into another vault, if I can call it that, a little room about three feet wide, six or seven feet high, and perhaps four feet deep. It was hardly more than a hole in the wall. Go on, I said. Go in. The Amontillado is in there. Fortunato continued to go forward, uncertainly. I followed him immediately. Soon, of course, he reached the back wall. He stood there a moment, facing the wall, surprised and wondering. In that wall were two heavy iron rings. A short chain was hanging from one of these and a lock from the other. Before Fortunato could guess what was happening, I closed the lock and chained him tightly to the wall. I stepped back. Fortunato, I said, put your hand against the wall. You must feel how the water runs over it. Once more, I ask you, please, will you not go back? No, if not, then I must leave you. But first, I must do everything I can for you. But, but, the Amontillado! <laughs> yes, yes, indeed, the Amontillado. As I spoke these words, I began to search among the bones. Throwing them to one side, I found the stones, which earlier I had taken down from the wall. Quickly, I began to build the wall again, covering the hole where Fortunato stood trembling. Montresor, what are you doing? I continued working. I could hear him pulling at the chain, shaking it wildly. Only a few stones remained to put in their place. Montresor, <laughs> this is a very good joke indeed. Many times we will laugh about it <laughs> as we drink our wine together. <laughs> Of course, as we drink the Amontillado. But is it not late? Should we not be going back? They'll be expecting us. Let us go. Yes, let us go. As I said this, I lifted the last stone from the ground. Montresor, for the love of God! Yes, for the love of God. I heard no answer. Fortunato? I cried. Fortunato? I heard only a soft, low sound, a half-cry of fear. My heart grew sick. It must have been the cold. I hurried to force the last stone into its position, and I put the old bones again in a pile against the wall. For half a century now, no human hand has touched them. May he rest in peace. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard about during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories, authors, and sources I used in the episode notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey Weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. 
I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.